between the 16th and 18th centuries, most of the European powers colonized and conquered the American continent, establishing numerous colonies and settlements. Spain, Portugal, France, England, the Netherlands, but also lesser known colonizers such as Sweden, Denmark and Scotland, managed to set up colonies that would evolve into the modern nations of the region. But one of the major powers of the time, which had both the resources and the naval capabilities to venture into the new world, did not partake in these endeavors. In this video, we will learn why the Ottoman Empire never competed with the other European states in the colonization of the Americas. In our opinion, learning new stuff and developing yourself is an essential part of being human. In our fast-paced world, it's often difficult to find enough time though, as our work, social lives and hobbies take most of our time. It's natural to think you don't have enough time to read a book, but the sponsor of this video, Blinkist, is here to help you with that problem. This is a unique app that takes the most important insights, new developments and know-how from thousands of non-fiction books, condensing them into a 15-minute long read or listen. As we have to work almost 24-7 to produce our videos, Blinkist is essential for our personal growth. If you're interested in the history of the era and the Ottomans, you will love Age of Discovery by Ian Goldin and Chris Kutana, as it draws useful parallels between the 16th century and our era, and The Silk Roads by Peter Frankopan, which talks about the creation of the trade network across Asia. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com slash Kings and Generals are going to get unlimited access for one week to try it out. You'll also get 25% off if you want the full membership. To understand why the Ottoman Empire did not expand into the New World, we first have to analyze the causes that drove the European expeditions that led to the discovery of the Americas and that brought the knowledge of the continent to the Old World. At the fall of Constantinople in 1453, the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt held a monopoly over the spice trade coming from Asia through the Red Sea. They imposed heavy taxes on all the exports towards Europe, and only the merchants of the Republic of Venice were allowed to trade with them, making a fortune by reselling the goods in the rest of Europe as a monopoly. Many European states were frustrated with this situation, as they could only go through the Italian city and one of those states was the Kingdom of Portugal. Portugal already had a tradition of expanding and exploring overseas, initially incited by a desire to spread the Christian faith and continue the Reconquista that had taken place in the Iberian Peninsula in the late Middle Ages. In 1415, King Zhuo had occupied the Moroccan city of Ceuta, obtaining a foothold on the North African coast at the southern mouth of the Strait of Gibraltar. His son, Henry the Navigator, would continue financing various expeditions to Africa and the Atlantic Ocean. His contemporary and biographer, Gomez Yanis Jejuara, wrote in 1453 that the prince was fueled by the zeal of God, by the desire for an alliance with the Christian kingdoms in the East, to know how powerful the Muslim countries were, to spread the Christian faith, and to fight the Moors of North Africa. While gold, ivory and slaves are not mentioned in Ezurara's chronicles, it's quite certain that the Portuguese were eager for those and were looking for the sources of the caravans that travelled through the Sahara Desert and enriched the markets of the Maghreb. Also, the input of the prince might have been exaggerated by chronicles and has been questioned by modern historians, as after his death in 1460, Portuguese explorers continued to push south the efforts of the deeply Christian Prince Henry, however, still resulted in the colonization of the Azores and Madeira Islands, where sugar was cultivated, and the exploration of the Atlantic coast of Africa, where outposts called feitarias and forts were established to trade with the local Africans and to attract Arab merchants. In the second half of the 15th century, the Portuguese explored the Gulf of Guinea, Sao Tome and Principe, and the Congo River. In 1488, the explorer Bartolomeu Diaz rounded the Cape of Good Hope, confirming that the Atlantic and Indian Oceans were connected. At the same time, two agents sent by King Zhuo II, Pero de Covilin and Afonso de Paiva, entered the Indian Ocean through the Mamluk Sultanate and reached India and Ethiopia. 
These travels made Perot advise the king to go via the maritime route around Africa, as it seemed the most secure of the options. The return of Gies was followed by the news that the Genoese explorer Christopher Columbus, who was hired by the kings of Castile and Aragon in the hopes of finding access to the Indian markets, had encountered land to the west. As Columbus had not brought back any spices, and it became quickly clear that this was a different landmass from Asia, the Portuguese returned their focus to their newly discovered African route, as the Treaty of Tordesillas, which we have already covered, attests to. In 1497, the Portuguese explorer Vasco de Guma circumnavigated the southern tip of Africa and sailed all the way to Calicut in India, known for its spice market, connecting the Indian spices to the newly established trade routes. Bases were set up along the way, and it would not take long for Portugal to enter into conflict with the Arab merchants that populated the Indian Sea. At the start of the 1500s, various conflicts between Muslim states, most powerful of them all the Mamluks, and the Portuguese navy, saw the latter partly blockading the Red Sea, starving the Egyptian state of spices. This caused the finances of the Mamluks to crash, and started a crisis that facilitated the Ottoman conquest of Egypt and Syria in 1516-1517, which was followed by their expansion into Arabia and the Red Sea. This brought the Ottoman Empire to the coast of the Indian Ocean, unfamiliar waters for the expanding Turk state. In 1555, the Ottomans would consolidate their position by expanding into Mesopotamia at the expense of the Safavids, and by taking Basra which meant that they now had access to the Persian Gulf. All this propelled the Ottomans to become the new power in the Indian Ocean. With access to both the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean, the Ottoman Empire could have started to venture into the New World, and we have some clues that they had intentions of doing so. In 1517, the Turkish captain Ahmed Mahidin Piri, known as Piri Reis, presented his world map to Sultan Selim, which he had produced by using as sources 20 other maps, including one from Columbus. On this map, the New World is marked as Vilayat Antilia. The term Vilayat usually applied to an administrative unit in the Ottoman Empire, so it's apparent that the Ottomans had some interests in America. In his diary, Piri Reis writes that a Spanish prisoner and Columbus's map were taken from seven Spanish ships, seizure of which has been dated to 1501 by historians. This Spanish captive revealed that he had been to the new continent three times, the same number of voyages Columbus had partaken in up to that year. This is also confirmed by the names on the map, which are the same Turkified names that Columbus used, such as Wadluk for Guadeloupe, and Undizi Vergine for the Virgin Islands. Other pieces of information could have come from the many Iberian Muslims who were expelled during those years, and it's very possible that there was a network of Muslim informants in Spain and Portugal who kept the Islamic world updated on the exploration of the two kingdoms. This would confirm that the Ottoman sultans were interested in the developments in the Atlantic Ocean. Sometimes it is said that the Ottomans did not have the naval technology to compete on the high seas with Portugal and Spain. This is, however, a myth, as we have already seen the Ottomans could hold their own against the Christian kingdoms in the Mediterranean Sea, and the maritime conflict continued against Portugal with a similar course in the Indian Ocean, keeping trade free in the Indian states for Muslim merchants and protecting the Sultanate of Aceh in modern-day Indonesia from the Portuguese in 1564. In 1627, Barbary Corsairs managed to reach Iceland and raid it, taking hundreds of slaves with them. It has to be remembered, in fact, that some of the technologies used by the Portuguese, such as the caravel and the compass, took inspiration from Arab and Muslim crafts and discoveries. One glaring problem, however, was the geographic situation the Ottomans found themselves in. On the other side of the African continent, and blocked from the exit to the Mediterranean Sea by Spain, the Ottomans found themselves having to circumnavigate the entire continent to reach the Americas. This was certainly not impossible, but it was still more expensive to do than for the rest of the European colonial powers. Also, they would have had to compete with the Portuguese navies replenished by their numerous bases. One way to overcome this problem 
was expanding through North Africa. It's not unlikely that one of the reasons for the Ottoman expansion in the Maghreb was to reach the Moroccan Atlantic coast, and from there compete with the Iberian powers. In the beginning, the Ottomans were quite successful, first in 1517 by taking under their wing the rulers of Algiers, most prominent of whom was Hayreddin Barbarossa, expanding at the expense of Spain into modern-day Algeria and Libya, and taking Tunis in 1560. The main roadblock was the staunchly independent Moroccan Sultanate. Morocco had been ruled from 1472 by the Wattasid dynasty. The Wattasids never managed to establish full control over the country. Ruling from the northern city of Fez, they lost various cities to both Portugal and Spain, while in 1524 they lost the city of Marrakesh to the rulers of the southern part of Morocco, the Saadi dynasty. The Saadi would continue to expand from the south, until in 1549 the city of Fez was occupied by their leader, Muhammad al-Sheikh, and he overthrew the Wattasid dynasty. Seeing an opportunity, the Ottomans attempted to reinstate a surviving Wattasid prince in 1554, but they were expelled and the prince killed in the Battle of Tadla the same year. They also tried to leverage their diplomatic resources to make the Saadi recognize them as their overlords, but to no avail, and instead, the Saadi helped Spain defend the city of Oran in Algeria. In the end, the frustrated Ottoman Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent would have Muhammad al-Sheikh assassinated in 1557 and have his head brought to Istanbul. But the Saadi allied themselves with the European powers and blocked access to the Atlantic from North Africa to the Ottomans. In the end, though, the main reason for why the Ottomans did not make a bigger effort to challenge the territories in the New World is quite simply that the true profitability of the new continent was still greatly unknown to both the Europeans and the Ottomans, unlike us who can attest to this in hindsight. Conversely, trade in the Indian Ocean was a well-established and rich business from before the times of the Roman Empire, and after the end of the Pax Mongolica, Indian trade had become even richer, funneling the goods that before travelled inland on the Silk Road. Columbus had sailed east to reach the Indies, and Brazil was accidentally discovered on a voyage to the Indian Ocean. Interest in the Indian Ocean was quite simply much greater in Istanbul. Silks were imported from the Chinese empires, while spices such as pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg and ginger were harvested and bought in India and in the islands of the Malay Archipelago. Attesting to the wealth that the spice trade brought is today's majestic city of Venice. The Ottoman Empire focused instead on securing its control of the entrance to the Red Sea by expanding into modern-day Yemen and Eritrea and establishing relationships with various Muslim princes in the Indian Ocean. More advanced gunpowder weapons and ships, together with their titles of caliph and protectors of the holy cities inherited from the Mamluks, put the Ottomans at the forefront of the other Muslim powers, and they would for years battle against the Portuguese for control of the trade routes in the region. At the end of the 16th century, the Ottoman Empire was not as powerful as at the start of the century, and their expansion halted as they entered a period of transformation that would continue into the 17th century. Suleiman the Magnificent supervised the Ottoman Empire at its height, and after his death in 1566, Cracks that had already appeared during his reign worsened with his successors. Corruption, factionalism and infighting paralyzed the Ottoman government machine, halting the state's ability to expand and partake in overseas ventures. The influx of precious metals into Europe from the New World increased inflation also in the Ottoman Sultanate, which led to poverty, economic crises and revolts. This is not to say that the Ottoman Empire inexorably declined, as it continued to survive for three centuries, but it did put a dent into the Ottomans' ability to project their power. Externally, the many foes of the House of Osman put a halt on their expansion. Following the annihilation of the Turkish navy after the Battle of Lepanto, the Ottomans still managed to rebuild their fleet in a year, but had lost many experienced sailors that could not be easily replaced. It showed that they could not just force the Straits of Gibraltar and that open-sea competition against the Iberians would be hard and costly. 
the defence of the Habsburgian border and the constant skirmishes against the Persians also kept the resources of the Ottoman Empire in use. To conclude, the lack of a Turkish presence in the New World can be explained by their geographic limits, their competitors on the borders, and most importantly, the richness of the trade in the Indian Ocean. We always have more stories to tell, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.